To find the area of the largest trapezoid, what we need to do first is draw a picture of the scenario described. Now we have a circle of radius one and we decided to center it at the origin for simplicity. Let's remember the equation of a circle here briefly. We know that the circle has the equation of this form and in this form h and k would represent the x and y coordinates of the center and then of course the r represents the radius now we decided to center our circle at the origin so that just means that our h and our k would both be zero and then of course the radius is equal to one so if we plug those values into this equation right here we would have x minus zero squared plus y minus zero squared is equal to one squared. That all simplifies to just x squared plus y squared is equal to one. So that's where we're getting the equation for that circle right there. And then again, inside of that circle, we've drawn a trapezoid and we've labeled a couple of dimensions. So you'll notice that this point lies on both the trapezoid and on the circle. And because it lies on the circle, we could give it an x and a y coordinate. And that simply means that, that this distance right here would be x and then this distance right here would be y and that would mean that right there that distance can also be labeled y which is why we've labeled it there and so with a nice labeled picture the next thing we need to do is to develop some equations now we are trying to maximize the area so we would need to know the formula for the area of a trapezoid now most of us remember that the area of a trapezoid is equal to one half times the sum of the bases and then times the height. So we're gonna plug in using our picture here. If we look at the bases, we do know that this base right here, the larger base of the trapezoid, would actually equal two. And we know that because this distance from here to here would represent the radius of the circle, and that radius is just one. And this distance over here is also the radius of the circle, which again is one. So putting them together, you would have a base length of two. So this is going to be two. And then the other base, which is this base right here, well, let's remember, this distance along the x-axis was just x. So that means that this distance is x. This other distance would also be x. Putting those together would give us a base length of 2x. So we're going to write 2x right here. And then the height of our trapezoid, again, is this dimension right here, which we noted earlier was equal to y. We can simplify this a bit because if we distribute the one half into the parentheses, we're going to end up with just one plus x and then multiplied by y. So there's our area equation. And this is what we're seeking to maximize. Sometimes your teachers might call this your objective equation. And then we're going to need another equation. Fortunately, we already developed that equation. It's the equation of the circle. Your teachers might call this the constraint equation. And after developing your objective and your constraint, the next thing you need to do is to solve the constraint, usually for y, and then plug that into your objective. Basically right now your objective has two different variables, x and y, and that's going to make our life more difficult. We need an objective equation with just one variable, and usually we try to get it in terms of x. So this means that we're going to solve the constraint for y, and it actually turns out there's a bit of a trick here. Because instead of solving it for y, it's going to be easier later on to solve this for y squared. And we'll see what we mean in just a moment. So let's take our constraint. Let's subtract x squared from both sides of it. So now we would see that y squared is equal to 1 minus x squared. Now you might be wondering, well, why would you do that? Because your objective doesn't have y squared. It only has y in it. Well, what we're going to do is square both sides of this. Now, if you square both sides of this, what happens is you now end up with the area squared. When you square the right side, you have to make sure you square the 1 plus x. So that just becomes 1 plus x squared. And then when you square y, you end up with y squared. And again, you're going to see later that this makes the computations a little bit simpler. Notice we've now introduced y squared into our objective equation. So we're going to substitute this 1 minus x squared in for that y squared right there. So we'll rewrite the objective as follows. It becomes area squared equals 1 plus x squared. And then the y squared, again, we'll substitute with 1 minus x squared. 
And that turns out to be easier because if you think about it, if we had solved for y, we would have ended up having to square root both sides and then we'd have the square root of one minus x squared. And that's okay, but that would mean later on in the problem when we do derivatives, we're gonna end up having to compute the derivative of a square root function, which is just not very pleasant. So it's gonna be easier, again, to express this in the way that we just did. And so even though we're maximizing the area of the trapezoid, our calculations are actually gonna maximize the area squared. So the key concept here is if we maximize area squared, that in turn will automatically maximize the area. So it's a little bit of a roundabout approach, but again, it allows us to avoid having to do the derivative of a square root function. So we have our objective. Notice it's in terms of just a single variable, just x. And so the next step is to compute the derivative of our objective equation. So if we do the derivative, we can write a squared prime to denote the derivative. On the other side, we're gonna end up having to do a product rule which also isn't very fun. Now, the way that I like to express my product rules is using this little mnemonic that I like to call fig plus gif. And in using that mnemonic, I define this first function as my f function, and then this second function as my g function. And in fact, why don't we take a moment to write down some of the components of our product rule right here. So again, we're gonna say that f is equal to one plus x squared and that g is equal to one minus x squared. We'll do the derivatives so that we can plug them into the product rule. Now for this derivative, you're gonna to have to kind of think about it as a chain rule. So the, the two gets pulled down in front, you recopy the inside function, you now raise it to the power of one, and then you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of one plus x is just one, so you end up multiplying this by one, which actually doesn't need to be written, does it? So there's the derivative of f, and now we need the derivative of g. This one's easy, this is just negative two x. So we're gonna plug all four of those components into this little product rule right here. So here we go, f prime would be two times one plus x times g, which is one minus x squared. Let's move this down a little bit. Plus, g prime, which is negative 2x. Now you're gonna add a negative 2x. That always looks messy to me, so instead of adding a negative, we'll just subtract. So you might wanna just write minus 2x right there, and then multiplied by f, which was the one plus x squared. So there is our derivative. You might recall that the next step was to set this equal to zero. And that's going to allow us to find a critical point. And so solving this is also kind of a challenge we see that perhaps we can factor out a one plus x that might make it a little bit easier. So we'll have one plus x factored out. In this first cluster of terms, if we factor out the one plus x, that leaves us with a two times one minus x squared. And then we have a minus two x. Now here you factored out a one plus x, but because it was squared, you still have an additional factor of one plus x left over. So it kind of looks like that set equal to zero. We'll clean up the inside. Why don't we distribute the two? We could distribute this two x as well. So inside we're gonna have two minus two x squared minus two x minus two x squared. Don't forget the one plus x that we had factored out. Continuing to simplify inside, we have some like terms, a minus two x squared and a minus two x squared make a minus four x squared and then a minus two X, and then a plus two. This is rather interesting. I suppose at this point we might just set each factor equal to zero. So we'll have one plus X equals zero. That's gonna be easy to solve. This one's not going to be fun, because it's a quadratic. Why don't we solve the easier one first? Subtract the one to the other side, we get X is equal to negative one, very good. Over here, we may wish to simplify it a little bit. Why don't we divide everybody here by negative two? This might make things a little bit nicer. Be careful, you're gonna change all the signs. So you're gonna end up with positive two x squared plus x minus one equals zero. It looks like we might get lucky in that this factors. Let's try to factor it. Okay, I had to pause the video for a moment there and work that out, but this should work because if you multiply 2x by x, you do get 2x squared. If you multiply 2x 
by one and then the negative one by x and combine, you actually do get a positive one x. And then of course you multiply negative one and positive one, you get a negative one. So that worked out nicely. We can further break that down by setting each of those factors equal to zero. And we end up here with x equals one half. This is another x equals negative one. We get repeated roots here, so this is actually disregardable because we already figured it out over there. So now we would plot these on a number line. You'd have to test which of the critical points maximizes the area. Now what's interesting here is we have x equals negative one, but that one might not be so sensible because for x equals negative one, if you went back and plugged that into the area equation, let's go back to the one area equation right before we had squared it. If I plug in negative one for x right there, I'm gonna have one plus negative one, which makes the area equal zero. And you can't really maximize the area of a trapezoid by making it equal zero. So the truth is we can reject the negative one outright and only look at the one half. And then what we do is we test some values on either side of one half. Remember here, you would have to test something less than one half, so maybe one fourth, and then something greater than one half, which would be one. And what you do is you plug it into the derivative. So you would have to do the derivative, which in our case was actually the derivative of a squared. You'd have to plug in the one fourth into that. And you'd have to see whether that comes out to be positive or negative. Now we have to go back and find our derivative which in its simplified form was right here. So yeah, that means we'd have to plug one fourth into this expression right here. I challenge you to do that on your own, definitely use a calculator to do that, but if you plug in one fourth, what you're going to find is that your result of plugging in one fourth is going to be greater than zero. So what that means is that the area squared function is increasing up to one half, just like that. Then next, you'd have to plug one into our derivative. And if you did that, plugging into this derivative here, you would find that it turns out to be less than zero. That just means the area squared function is decreasing like that. So lo and behold, we can see from this little visualization that at one half, we have achieved a maximum value for the area squared. And remember, if we maximize area squared, then we actually maximize the area as well. So this means that the maximum area occurs when x is equal to one half. But let's make sure we've answered the question. The question wants us to actually find the area. It doesn't want us to find the x value that maximizes the area. It wants the area. So we're gonna need to go back and plug in to find the actual area. And perhaps to do that, we're gonna steal our area squared function. We'll come down here. There it is right there. We'll plug in the one half for x, so you're gonna have area squared equals one plus a half squared, and then one minus a half squared, like so. And if you're allowed to, you could pick up a calculator and simplify this. If not, you'd have to do some fraction work here, but I'm using my calculator right now. And when I compute this all out, I get an area squared equal to 27 sixteenths. Interesting. And then finally, to get the maximum area itself, I would square root both sides of this equation. When I square root the right side, I'm gonna square root the top and bottom separately. That gives me radical 27 over four. And we can probably simplify radical 27 to be radical nine times radical three. And that's nice because the square root of nine is three. So you end up with three radical three over four. That's the maximum area of that trapezoid. Thanks for taking the time to watch that rather lengthy video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I would greatly appreciate it. But if not, I appreciate you taking the time to watch regardless.